so at this point then I want to turn it over to uh, my colleague Monica Kaner. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us. I just wanted to thank uh, this evening GE Foundation who make who made this all possible, um, Project Echo headquarters in New Mexico as we use their platform, as well as our partners in Cambodia, the Ministry of Health, CalMet Hospital, and the other host, provincial hospitals that we are currently working with. I will now pass it over to my colleague Vaughn, who will get us started on the presentation. Vaughn, can you hear me? I think you might be muted. Yes, I am, sorry. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Vaughn. Um, I'd just like to take a few minutes to discuss some points on etiquette. Uh, firstly, we'd like to remind you that the ECHO platform is founded on love and respect, so we rely on you guys to keep ECHO a safe and collegial space for learning. Please make sure to test your equipment uh, ahead of time to ensure your audio and video are working. This minimizes distractions. There will be time for Q&A, questions and answers at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, you have two options. You can write your question in the chat box located at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen during the course of the meeting, and we'll make sure to try and address it during the Q&A session. Or you can use the raise hand function when we get to that portion you can find this under the participants list um, at the bottom toolbar. After you click that, you'll see the participants list pull up on the right side of your screen and you click the raise hand button and the moderator will call on you when it's your turn. Please remember to mute your microphone when you're not speaking. The mute button is located at the left bottom corner of your screen, but then remember to unmute it when you're speaking. We ask that if it's feasible that you turn on your webcam and position it optimally to show your face or to capture the whole group you're with, preferably with the light source in the front. We value the communal nature of these meetings and think your face is enhanced in this experience. Um, when you speak, please do so close to a microphone for optimal audio. And finally, should you have any IT issues, just send a message through the chat function or via email. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Bridget Hurry. Thank you, Vaughn. I'm just going to, um, can you hear me okay? Okay, great. I'm just going to review the agenda. I will give a around a 10 minute didactic on oxygen therapy as it applies to our global care for the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, as well as address some of the pressing questions that were um, unanswered after our session number one. And then uh, we will hear from my colleague, Dr. Wang, about uh, lessons learned. And then we would love to move into the question and answer uh, forum for questions here today. Um, I might need your, well, let me try one more time. Are you seeing my screen? No, we're not. Let me, let me share mine. Okay, that'd be great. Thank you. And you can start at learning objectives. Perfect. Yeah. Bridget, before you start, I think that our Khmer interpreter needs to unmute because we're not hearing him on the Chinese channel. You can go back one slide, Chase. Thank you. Okay. Um, 
Our learning objectives for our session two here in ECHO will be to increase our detection and management of hypoxemia, to improve our delivery and monitoring of patients on oxygen therapy, and to use these skills then to improve our collaborative care for the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide. I'll begin just reviewing oxygen therapy as we can uh, find it applied to the COVID-19 pandemic. As we can recall from session number one, COVID-19 is a respiratory illness. 81% of COVID-19 positive patients will present with mild illness. This can um, subjectively and objectively present as fever, cough, and sore throat. 14% 14 14 will present with severe disease, which we see as the clinical cases of pneumonia, and 5% will present with critical disease, seen as acute respiratory distress syndrome, septic shock, or multi-organ failure. While we have found there to be about a 1% chance of cases presenting asymptomatically. This is a slide just defining the um, severe disease, which again is a pneumonia. We'll have patients with low oxygen saturation rates, increased respiratory rates, and other clinical and um, objective uh, imaging findings uh, consistent with pneumonia. For ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome, it is a, a syndrome, it is an advanced uh, pulmonary disease that we see in our critical patients and is one of the key uh, risks of mortality for our COVID-19 positive patients. To begin, we need to have hypoxemia defined. And essentially, hypoxemia is the insufficient delivery of oxygen in our blood. The WHO defines this as a um, peripheral capillary oxygen saturation, or SpO2, less than 90%. We can see hypoxemia in clinical conditions, such as our COVID-19 positive patients, presenting with pneumonia, ARDS, sepsis, and shock. But we must remember our experience with hypoxemia as seen in other cl clinical scenarios, such as malaria, trauma, surgery, and numerous obstetrical complications. Patients may present with signs and symptoms that include cough, shortness of breath, increased heart rate or respiratory rate, fatigue, accessory muscle use, as well as confusion. The key for the treatment of hypoxemia is early detection and then the implementation of oxygen therapy. Without these crucial steps, we, our patients are at risk for the associated morbidity and mortality seen with hypoxemia. The two key ways of detecting hypoxemia are with the use of a pulse oximeter with pulse oximetry or an arterial blood gas. A pulse oximeter is a machine that measure, measures oxygen saturation in the blood. It is non-invasive and it is accurate. It transmits a light beam, beam through a distal digit such as a finger or toe or even an earlobe, and it is able to measure the arterial oxygen saturation. For our care of COVID positive patients, we should be, um, it should be imperative to test pulse oximetry on all severe or critical presenting patients. Oxygen therapy is reserved for uh, patients presenting with hypoxemia and other complications such as cardiorespiratory arrest, respiratory distress, hypoxemia, which we would define as 
the saturation is from 93% or lower, I'm sorry, hypoxia, a lower oxygen level, as well as low blood pressure or a decreased cardiac output and uh, a side effect of metabolic, metabolic acidosis. When, after we have acute, uh, identified our hypoxemia and we have decided that we, have the, we are in need of initiating oxygen therapy, the goals of treatment are a saturation oxygen level greater than 90% in non-pregnant patients, 92% in pregnant patients, and to have the patient resume a normal respiratory rate defined as less than 24 breaths a minute without the use of accessory muscle uh, recruitment, so nest normal respiratory effort. When you are thinking of administering oxygen therapy, we must be very intentional to see it as an essential medical drug. Just as the use of any other essential medical drug, when we prescribe oxygen, we must think of the other indications needed for the correct delivery of, or the correct administration of oxygen therapy, including the flow rate, the type of delivery system, monitoring parameters, when to report uh, oxygen abnormalities, when to change the device that is in use, and how to wean off or discontinue oxygen administration. At a, um, as we increase our level of um, oxygen flow, there are various forms of delivery systems available. Nasal cannula is able to deliver oxygen up to about five liters per minute. With the use of a face mask, which could be a simple face mask, a partial rebreathing mask, or a non-rebreathing mask, we can deliver up to 20, 10 to 20 liters per minute. The use of non-invasive ventilation is available through CPAP or BiPAP and can administer up to 60 liters per minute. In the clinical scenario for COVID, it is um, discouraged to use CPAP or BiPAP as there is an increased risk of aerosolization. And at, if for those patients who are in need of up to 60 liters per minute, it should be considered to um, use invasive or mechanical ventilation at this juncture. So mechanical ventilation is an aerosol generating procedure. So healthcare workers must use airborne transmission precautions. We remember from session one that hand hygiene, respiratory precaution, respiratory hygiene, as well as PPE or uh, personal protective equipment is essential to, oh, you can go back, sorry for not um, uh, having droplet or contact transmission. But in the, um, during the course of any aerosol generating procedure, we must add the additional precautions for airborne transmission. It's important to pre-oxygenate a patient uh, with a, up to a FiO2 of 100%. And in mechanical ventilation will require an endotracheal tube or tracheostomy placement. This um, slide, as you can see to the left, uh, is a spectrum of COVID-19 management for mild to moderate or severe and then rescue or adjunct therapy. The take home points here are to be sure that we are not missing a concomitant bacterial infection, to ensure that we are using our definition of hypoxemia and managing it appropriately to achieve uh, target SpO2s of 92% or higher. We must recognize that with COVID-19 patients, we've seen that higher PEEP levels are required. 
and there has been some um, use and recommendations for prone ventilation. So the placement of a patient in their, on their abdomens, in their prone position. And we'll review this um, a little bit uh, in more detail in a few slides. When we are working with our COVID-19 population, we must be always strongly suspicious for the occurrence of rapid deterioration as many patients have clinically presented. With the need for healthcare workers to be in their personal protective equipment, we must be mindful that that takes about five to seven minutes to put on or don the gear. We must have our healthcare facilities uh, equipped and stocked with our in in intubation kits and checklists for rapid sequence intubations. As I mentioned, uh, proning is an adjunct therapy that is uh, being recommended uh, very recently. There was a study out of France that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2013 that showed uh, successful um, improvement in VQ matching for mechanically ventilated patients. Recent studies, even out of um, Mass Massachusetts General Hospital, associated with Harvard Medical School, have found that the early use of proning patients, even with mild disease, can enable us to, to lessen the load for patients advancing and requiring mechanical ventilation. The, the positioning should begin slowly, up to one hour a day, and should be increased by, per patient uh, comfort and tolerance up to 12 to 16 hours a day for any mechanically ventilated patient. Now that we've had a refresher on oxygen therapy and hypoxemia, as well as um, how that can apply to our COVID-19 population, I'd like to address some specific questions that were left unanswered from our session number one. A very insightful question was asked, how can we adapt healthcare systems to ensure continued access to essential services such as maternal child health, HNHIV, during the COVID-19 pandemic. There has been um, excellent use of cohorting or the um, grouping of COVID-19 positive patients into uh, community facilities such as schools or hotels or stadiums so that the existing healthcare facilities can be continued to have uh, medical access for other essential services. Depending on the country's strategy, this cohorting can be reversed where COVID net positive patients are cohorted or grouped in the healthcare facilities and the community facilities can be refurbished uh, such as hotels, schools, or auditoriums to uh, deliver the other continued services such as HIV therapy or maternal fetal health. Another question was asking about the effects of COVID-19 on pregnancy. Currently, we see that the management for pregnant COVID-19 positive patients is essentially the same as for those who are non-pregnant. We have not had any documented cases of intrauterine transmission. We have not found any virus detected in vaginal secretions or amniotic fluid. And we have not found any virus found in breast milk. While steroid therapy is strongly discouraged for the management of most COVID-19 positive patients, the use of steroid therapy for fetal lung maturity is still supported in the obstetrical situation. There is no contraindication to um, epidural anesthesia and there are a few anecdotal reports of possible negative sequelae from the use of anti-steroidals. So the recommendation for the management of postpartum 
COVID positive patients is to use paracetamol or acetaminophen as the first line agent. And if non-steroidals are necessary, to use them at their, uh, their uh, lowest effective dose. What are some community awareness strategies for protection against COVID-19? The first priority for any community is a mass education effort to educate our community on hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, which is the covering of your mouth with any uh, cough or sneeze, as well as social distancing to avoid uh, droplet transmission within one meter of contact with a COVID positive patient. We can recruit community ownership by inviting them for different uh, campaigns such as making cloth masks for the use of the public uh, in non-medical situations where social distancing can be compromised. How can we strengthen our infection prevention and control including our, our personal protective equipment and our healthcare worker capacity in a sustainable way. The key to stewarding our PPE and healthcare worker capacity uh, effectively is to minimize the need for personal protective equipment use. Again, there, we have seen that the cohorting or grouping of COVID positive patients or the designation of healthcare workers to a cohorted or grouped area of COVID positive patients allows for a um, less frequent need to change out their PPE, as well as it allows for an extended use of PPE prior to having to re re, uh, remove and reapply. It is also important to educate our public on the appropriate uses for PPE, including the fact that N95 respirators are only indicated for during the course of a healthcare worker doing uh, an aerosolized procedure. So these limited resources should not be worn by the general public. How can we prepare for COVID in resource de deficient settings? Again, we need to, uh, as a uh, globe, we need to prioritize the basic uh, preventive skills for any droplet or contact transmitted disease. That is hand hygiene, respiratory hygiene, and um, social distancing. For our triage or healthcare facilities, even in a resource deficient setting, we need to prioritize triaging and prompt isolation of any suspected COVID positive patient. As we have, um, even in the setting of no testing, if we have a patient with clinical symptoms that is a suspected COVID positive status, we need to be at para, uh, in very um, intentional to protect our healthcare workers, to keep them protected from acquiring the disease and taking them off of our front lines. And lastly, is there a way to reuse PPE or our personal protective equipment? Well, currently the WHO recommends that the reuse of PPE will be only a temporary measure and avoided after the care of any severely or critically ill COVID positive patient. We recognize, however, that our global supply of PPE is limited and while resources are being produced um, daily in, in um, determined efforts, in a temporary measure, there are some reusable uh, recommendations. The key point of the PPE gear is to never reuse gloves. We have not found that to have any um, efficacy and it can be dangerous. So gloves are the only aspect of the personal protective equipment gear that should not be reused. 
for cohorted co positive patients, we can use the extended use or the extended wear up to six hours for gowns, masks, goggles, as well as respirators, but they should be replaced if soiled or damaged. We also have some early studies on the um, reprocessing of respirators, including the use of UV radiation, moist heat, and hydrogen peroxide vapor. And lastly, for any use of goggles, face shields, or face masks, they can be cleaned with soap, detergent, and water, or 70% alcohol, as long as hand hygiene is initiated before and after the handling of the contaminated face shield, goggles, or, or um, face mask. Thank you. I'd like to now turn it over to my colleague, who's gonna share with us some of his experience with um, COVID in his clinical scenario. Thank you. Thanks, Bridget, that was, that was really great, and I hope that everybody uh, was able to get a little bit more out of that than we were last week. I know we were short on time. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody that if you have further questions, uh, please write them in the chat box now or raise your hand. Um, and then before we move over to Dr. Wong, uh, I'm going to send out a poll right now. You'll see it uh, appear on your screen. And if you could just take a few, uh, one minute, it's very short uh, to answer these uh, three questions. Uh, and then we'll pass it over to Dr. Wong. Are you all able to see it? Okay, everybody, take just about 30 more seconds uh, to finalize your answers, and then we're going to move on. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, Dr. Wong, I'd like to hand it over to you. As I mentioned before, uh, Dr. Wong is a doctor from China who is currently uh, doing a fellowship in uh, Canada, but he is going to uh, answer any of your questions and maybe just give us a little bit of uh, info on what he has learned about COVID. Hey, thank you everyone. So, uh, thank you everyone to organize the webinar. 
and I'm going to share some information about the COVID-19. So firstly, I answer some questions one by one. So first question is, do we have evidence to support airborne transmission? If yes, what, imp uh, what implications in terms of current prevention measures? So the answer is yes, the airborne transmission of COVID-19 is possible, but it's not approved now. So one study found the virus could be detectable in the air up to three hours after shading. So it's better for us to, so based on this information, it's better for us to take some additional airborne precautions. For example, so the in the hospital, the patient should be isolated in a negative pressure room uh, in the hospital or maintaining the room closed always. And uh, it's better to perform the masking fitting test in advice for every healthcare providers. So second question is, is explain how triaging can be done in our weak health systems. So uh, in my hospital, we have uh, an algorithm. So the first step, we will screen the patient. If the patient have higher risk, it, it will based on the family history. For example, if the patient uh, have direct contact with some, you know, convert COVID-19 patient, or if have any travel history to epicenter, similarly. So if have some, you know, high risk, if no, if no high risk, so this baby, this patient should be admitted to a general clinic. If yes, so go to next step. So we're transferred to a designated clinic to analyze this clinical size and complete the CBC and the chest X-ray in a separate room. If the CBC, if the chest X-ray is, is normal, so exclude it, so go to the general clinics. If one of them is positive, so go to the next step. So, so the patient should be diagnosed as the suspected of COVID-19, so should a child to an isolated ward to complete the chest CT and the test for the SARS coronavirus 2, so that is the passenger for the COVID-19. And uh, if the CT, if the uh, nuclear test, nuclear, nuclear acid test is negative, so exclude the COVID-19. So the patient could be discharged with isolation or transferred to other words. If positive, so the patient as a confirmed diagnosis of COVID-19 should be built. So this patient, uh, should treat it in that isolated world, or you know, transferred to a designated hospital for further treatment. So this is the second question. Next question is the is the vaccine from COVID nineteen still being tested? Can the influenza vaccine um, be a recommendation in making a COVID nineteen vaccine? Yes, the vaccine for COVID nineteen is currently on clinical trials. Uh, to my understanding, there are two clinical trials in China. So my hospital is uh, also involved in the, my, my university also involved the clinical trials. So the result is still pending. Uh, and we still have to wait at least uh, eight months or more longer term for, the, for its ability on clinical use. The vaccine for influenza doesn't show any protective effect against the COVID-19. However, the winter is a influenza season. So in the winter, routine uh, influenza vaccination still recommended. So next question, is there any evidence of long-term immunity for those that are recovering from the disease? There is limited evidence on this topic based on studies focusing on you know, other coronavirus, some previous coronavirus outbreak, such as the SARS, such as MERS, 
some researchers estimated that immunity could last about uh, two to three years, but it's still uncertain. Immunity also is depend on the patient's condition. For some young patient and a previously healthy patient, so they are more likely to have lung acting and a robust immunity. And the investigation on the level of IgG and IgM for the virus are carried out to explore the long-term immunity. Next question, what are the chances of reinfection? So this is an important question. The risk of reinfection is very low, is very low. So the antibodies, antibodies could be produced in the patient's body about 10 days after, after the patient contracted the virus. The antibodies will be preventing them from reinfection. Some cases of likely reinfection could have underlying causes. The most common may be the test is false negative default discharge. So the false negative may be because of inappropriate sampling or maybe the sensitivity of the tool kit, that the test kit is not good. The sensitivity is low. Next question. For critical cases intubated in an ICU, what is the average recovery time? So actually, I didn't get relevant information about this question. Generally, the mortality rate of intubated patients in ICU is very high, nearly 15%. So half of the patient, half of the intubated patient may be died. But it is widely available, depend on the ICO's competency and the medical resources. The so average recovery time is uncertain, and it should not be uniform for some elderly patients or those with you know, underlying healthy issues. They have to stay in ICO for a longer time. Next question. How long will you be infections before your mountain immune response? In the body, after infection, the body could produce the antibodies. So the antibodies could prevent the, you know, oh, so sorry. So the antibodies could be detectable in the body after infection. But whether you are infection may depend on the copies and activity of the virus from our limited knowledge, even a symptomatic patient could, so could, be, the result, could be the sources of infection, and the virus could be detected in the stool up to 20 days after recovery in a case. Next question, what are the best practice for fighting COVID-19? So in order to fight COVID-19, Every person, community, hospital, and a health authority should cooperate and uh, make efforts together. Personally, I think the most important is for every person to take precautions seriously. Staying at home, maintaining social physical distancing, hand hygiene, respiratory etiquette. These are the best practices to slow down the spread of COVID-19. Next uh, question, what is the level of risk of transmitting the infection by a symptomatic patient? Actually, it is still high. Some studies found that a symptomatic patient could share the virus and the viral load is similar to a symptomatic patient. And especially during the, the early stage, the viral uh, load uh, reaches the peak at about three to five days after infection. So in light of this information, more and more countries uh, suggested wearing the mask in public area, including China and uh, some United States and Canada gradually suggested, yeah, changes the, you know, the policy. But uh, because we don't know even you didn't present any symptom, you don't know whether you are infected or not. So everyone wear a mask 
will prevent others from infection. Therefore, we slow down the COVID-19 outbreak. Next question, what has been your experience at your hospital dealing with COVID-19? So my hospital is a children's hospital. So we received uh, some favored children from Hubei province. Hubei province is the epicenter of COVID-19. So based on the symptom and the high risk of infection, such patient should be diagnosed of suspected patient, suspected COVID-19. So slow swabs were sent to a nucleic acid test for coronavirus, as well as other respiratory viruses, such as RSV, some influenza virus, we were sent together. Meanwhile, the portable chest X-ray and some in essential labs, including the CBC, the liver function, renal function, uh, also will be done simultaneously. Then the patient was transferred to isolated wards for further investigation and treatment. If the nucleic acid test is positive, so the patient will be referred to the designated hospital. Next question, what was the most difficult part of dealing with COVID-19 in your hospital? So just as I said, because my hospital is not a COVID-19 designated hospital, so actually we didn't admit many COVID-19 patients. Personally, I think the largest challenge for most hospitals is how to cope with the patient's surge in a short time in, during, the, during the early stage. Once the patient's number exceeds the healthcare system burden, it will cause a terrible result. So such result occurred in China, Italy, some European countries, also in United States now. What do you wish you had prepared? So next question. What do you wish you have prepared for earlier? So enough stockpile of TPE, so personal preventive equipment, is insufficient to protect healthcare providers. So I think the hospital and the public should stock enough PPE. It will reduce the risk of healthcare providers' infection and it will reduce their anxiety. Next question. What most surprised you about the COVID-19? For me, personally, I think the COVID-19 affecting so many population and causing so many deaths is out of my expectation. Everyone should consider they are under the risk of infection. So everyone should take precautions seriously. Prevent yourself, also prevent others. So last question. What is most important in caring for COVID-19 patients? Taking precautionary measures seriously, keep a healthcare provider safe is critical. So the hospital should take precautionary education for every healthcare provider and to supply enough PPE to them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. That was, that was really great. Uh, at this point, we'd like to open it up for any other questions that people may have. I think there might have been a few coming in through the chat. Yeah, Chase, there are a few that have come in through the chat. Um, I will hold off for a minute to see if anyone wants to raise their hand or ask a question themselves. Um, and if not, I will address uh, some of the questions in the chat. Okay, I think we will get started in the chat. Again, please um, continue to add questions. Um, we'll, we have some time for Q&A for both um, Dr. Hur and Dr. Wang. So um, Dr. Hur, I know you uh, addressed this a little bit in the chat already, but I think it's an important question. So just for everyone to understand a little bit more, um, what 
is the best method to sterilize reusable PPE for non-severe cases if needed? Yes, thank you, Monica. Um, the WHO has uh, offered some reprocessing or um, reusing uh, PPE recommendations for non-severe, for after use with non-severe COVID positive patients and without a compromise such as soiling or damage to the PPE gear. For, um, again, to review the PPE, it involves a gown, um, it involves gloves, it involves eye shield or eye protection, not just prescription glasses, it has to have coverage to the lateral or sides of the face, as well as a face mask. So for face shields or goggles, those can be cleaned with soap or detergent and water, or they can be cleaned with 70% alcohol wipes. It is imperative to recognize that after handling your con contaminated PPE goggles or face shield, you must perform hand hygiene after contact with the contaminated PPE. For respirators or face masks, there are some efforts to sterilize them with um, various modes of um, decontamination, including hydrogen peroxide vapor, moist heat, or ultraviolet uh, radiation, but these are all still in testing phases. For gowns or aprons, you can try and wash at high temperatures any cotton gown, and the um, temperature recommended is 60 to 90 degrees Celsius. Um, if there is a lack of protective gowns, you can also try uh, substituting with other protective uh, aprons, such as a disposable, impermeable plastic apron or a lab coat. The other key for um, the extension of our PPE supply is to try and have extended use. And for any PPE uh, piece of equipment other than gloves, the recommendation is to use up to six hours of continued use and to then change at that time. But it is not proven to be safe or recommended to reuse gloves. Those should be disposed of between any patient contact or contaminated um, secretion uh, contact. Dr. Wang, anything to add? Yeah, I could add some information to this question. You know, now I'm, you know, get some, get training, fair training in the University of Manitoba. So here, last month, the universities, they conducted a study about how to sterilize the, you know, the, the, N95, because the N95 is a very important component of the PPE. And uh, here, I think in some hospitals, uh, they also face a shortage of N95. So they conducted a study, and the study, the result showed the autoclaving, uh, auto so, you know, autoclaving is the best approach to clean the N95. So based on this study, the policy here is we collect the used N95. If, if the respirator is not uh, damaged, is not uh, solided, so we will collect and uh, we will, you know, use the uh, autoclaving to sterilize it and reuse it. So it's, uh, it's an approach to uh, to reuse the N95 in here, yeah. Thank you. Um, again, these questions are um, for, for both doctors. So um, I'm just gonna uh, put two questions together here. Um, how long do you think the pandemic might drag on? And also how high is the potential of COVID-19 coming back as a second and or third wave? So, yeah, it's, uh, this is a great question. So, you know, yesterday I read a news, this uh, comment from 
one professor in Shanghai, in China, and uh, uh, he's Dr. Zhang, and uh, he comment, maybe next uh, next year, not next year, maybe this winter, next winter. So the COVID-19 will, you know, re-emerge again, because it's it's impossible for for us to uh, to kill the virus at uh, at this summer. So, and uh, you know the. COVID-19, the coronavirus is, is different from previous coronavirus, such as the SARS, such as MERS, because the, because the, you know, uh, the, this coronavirus could cause, the, we, we how to, how to say it, so that means the, it's, it's, the infectivity is very high. It could cause why the spread across the population, and uh, but it could be, um, uh, it could cause lightened infection. That means the virus is staying in the in the body. So maybe next uh, winter, it will you know be reactivated, but it's not a center. It may be. And uh, yeah, I get the comment from the professor yesterday. Dr. Hurry, do you have any comments on that question or should we move on? I think there is a lot of speculation um, uh, and it's, it's a, it's a, it's a great question. It's interesting in the hospital that I work at, um, we have actually peaked in our COVID uh, positive population, and we are on a descending um, uh, decline. Um, and that was consistent with um, the epidemiology that we um, expected based on the time of our uh, hospital here in the Colorado Denver region's um, first uh, exposure and then the implementation of social distancing, hand hygiene, and respiratory hygiene. Um, however, we do know that there's going to be a delay in when different communities um, have their surge or their introduction. Uh, so um, I know that there's a decline happening in certain communities. And as to whether there's gonna be a resurgence, there is a lot of speculation that that is possible. Um, and uh, as uh, Dr. Wing shared, um, when that will be could, could coincide with the next flu season of, uh, for, our, for, our, for our population. Okay, thank you. Another question to both of you. Um, did the use of RDT for seroprevalence testing help in the prevention and detective, detection of COVID-19? Um, you know, so as a policy in China now, uh, because uh, currently, the, most of the patient in China is imported patient from other countries. So the policy in China now is we both we take both the you know the PCR and the serologic test. So both we will test. So the PCR is gold standard, but the PCR also have slightly relatively higher false negative. So first time. The PCR, the false, false negative is 13%. The second time is 15%. So sometimes we will combine together, but all the, ser the serological test also has its drawbacks during the early stage. It, uh, you know, maybe it's too early to identify, to detect the IgG or IgM. So we, we will combine them together. So another advantage we will perform the serology test is uh, 
you know, in Wuhan during the COVID-19 outbreaks, uh, we take the, we perform an innovative treatment. It's not uh, actually innovative treatment. Uh, we only use the, you know, some conver a convalescent patient, use the convalescent plasma and transfused to the critical patient. So based on the IgG, IgM testing, if positive or if the title is high, so we will obtain, we will obtain the, the blood samples, uh, plus, uh, plasma samples from the recovering patient and transfuse to the patient. It will be effective for some patients. And I agree with Dr. Wing, while we recognize PCR or polymerase chain um, uh, assays are the gold standard for testing, the reagents and the testing um, swabs and the consumable resources for that testing is going to be um, a deterrent for, for mass testing. So um, the use of ser serological testing, especially with rapid diagnostic uh, modalities, will be key in the um, decline in our transmission as we see, especially in the case of asymptomatic patients. So while the, the testing has to improve its sensitivity, um, I think there is a place for that, uh, for more um, uh, exaggerated testing on, a, on larger scales to especially help us identify and quickly isolate patients who have an asymptomatic COVID positive uh, presentation. Great, thank you. Again, we wanna give anyone the chance here to ask any final questions that they might have. I do wanna give a last word to Dr. Hurry and Dr. Wang, particularly um, in light of your specialties. We will be talking about uh, both of these in our, our later series, but Dr. Hurry, if you have anything to mention uh, or note in relation to COVID-19 and pregnancy and Dr. Wang, um, anything in COVID-19 um, and um, pediatrics or neonates, babies, um, that would be great, I think, for the participants on the call. Um, yes, as far as our um, pregnant or obstetrical population, um, we uh, here in the United States have had a significant amount of um, uh, exposure to patients, uh, late, pregnant patients who present for labor or other obstetrical um, needs. And then within two to five days of hospital admission, they rapidly deteriorate, some requiring um, mechanical ventilation, some requiring intensive uh, care therapy and some um, just requiring isolation. So we are finding that the um, pregnant patient does present uh, a sub subtype of potential immunocompromised condition that can make the pregnant uh, woman more susceptible to uh, disease. This said, however, we're not finding transmission through vaginal secretions or amniotic fluid. So we're not finding transmission through intrauterine uh, mode. And we're not finding transmission through breast milk. However, for a COVID positive mom or pregnant patient, the child is now a um, person under investigation. And so for a newborn, the recommendation is to consider isolation of the in newborn infant from the mother. And this has to be taken on a case-by-case -case basis, as this may not be feasible in many of our clinical scenarios. But if isolation is not possible, the recommendation is that the pregnant COVID-positive patient expresses breast milk, and then it is delivered to the infant by a, a secondary healthy um, uh, relative or adult. 
and again, as many physical barriers as possible, such as plastic walls or separate uh, curtains are important to maximize distancing between the COVID positive pregnant patient and the newborn infant. Yeah, so I, I want to comment about the, you know, the vertical transmission from the maternal circulation to the fetal circulation. So based on the existing evidence, the likely uh, the likelihood of the vertical transmission is very low, but there is a study involving uh, five neonates. So the mom is COVID-19 confirmed patient, and uh, say the researchers you know perform both the PCR and uh, the serologic test, and all the for for both the mom and uh, the the neonates, and uh, all the PCR for the neonates is negative. But two patients, the serologic test is positive, it's, the IgM is positive for the neonates. So it's very interesting because we know the, the IgM is the, you know, the larger molecular structure. It's not easy to pass the placenta. So the PCR is negative, but IgM is positive. So maybe the viral load is, is low, so cause the PCR false negative. But the limitation of that, of that study is they didn't perform the placenta pathologic examination. So we can't exclude if any you know, placenta damage to cause the, to cause the virus past the, uh, to pass the placenta. And uh, in my hospital, we also have a case, the mom, uh, is a 13, four weeks pregnant woman, and the mom presented with fever and uh, shortness of breath, so admitted to a maternal hospital, and uh, get the c cell section to deliver the baby. And uh, we perform the, you know, the PCR for both the mom and uh, the neonate. For the mom, we obtain the amniotic fluids, the breast milk, the cord, sample, the cord blood sample, all is negative. And uh, for the neonatal, we sent uh, the, uh, the sputum, the slot swappers, the inner swappers, the serum. And uh, every day, last uh, seven days, all is negative. So commonly, we think the, the risk of vertical transmission is low, but we still can't exclude. So, you know, the policy in Winnipeg here, after the baby was born, the baby could stay with the mom. If the baby doesn't uh, present with any symptom, the mom could, yeah, the baby could stay with mom, but should keep her the physical distancing at least two meters. And uh, also we recommend breast milk feeding, but the mom should, should take, you know, serious, Yes, the uh, droplet and the contact precautions to wear the N95 and uh, to hygiene to perform the hygiene. So we still recommend the breast milk. Yeah. Thank okay, you. that's great. Oh, go ahead. Dr. Wang, were you finished? No, yeah, I, I finished. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, uh, I don't think there are any other questions. Uh, Chase, did you have any questions that you pulled? Uh, no, I, I, I think that we have uh, come to the end of questions. Okay, great. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Chase, I'll pass it along to you in a second, but I do want to flag to everyone on this call that we are going to be continuing this, these sessions. Um, as of next week, we will be holding two sessions per week, one on Wednesday and one on Friday mornings. They will each be an hour earlier than now, um, so just a little bit earlier, but same time, about 60 minutes. Uh, we're going to try to keep them short and sweet. 
Um, and they will be in partnership with the Vanderbilt Institute for Global Health. We're creating a lecture series. Um, and so we're very excited about that. They're going to be um, just as good as the ones we've had with Dr. Wang and Dr. Bridget Hurry. And um, so please keep an eye out for those invitations, as well as we will be sending a follow-up email to this uh, session with the recording of the session, as well as the presentation, the PowerPoint. Chase, over to you. Thanks, Monica. Um, and thank you again to uh, Dr. Hurry for hosting another session with us um, and discussing oxygen therapy. And thank you, Dr. Wong, for taking some time out of your evening to be here with us as well and uh, discuss all of that. Um, I'd like to thank our interpreters again uh, for, for joining us and, and helping us connect with a larger audience. Uh, and I would like to thank all of you for joining us and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang, Dr. Hurry. We really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good morning. Yes, Bye. <laughs>